Thank you very much, Jason, and thank you to the entire Intel team for all the work that they do with the open um, community. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Uh, as, as our board has evolved and changed over the years, he's the one person that's, that's been there from the very beginning and a wonderful uh, icon in the industry. It's my pleasure to welcome Andy Bechtelsheim. Yeah. <clears throat> So uh, I want to talk about what's happening with um, optics and networking. Uh, but before I go into the optics, let me just give you a little backdrop here. As you know, it was only a little more than 10 years ago when Apple announced the first iPhone, and the world has completely changed in the last uh, 10 years. We now have billions and billions of smartphones connecting to millions and millions in, uh, to servers in the cloud, providing all these services that we, we all use every day. And this obviously has led to the construction of these gigantic uh, data centers, otherwise known as hyperscale data centers. This is a picture of a, a Facebook data center in, in Virginia, but there's many others like it across the country that host all these servers in aggregate. Uh, it is believed there's over 10 million servers running in the cloud uh, today. And going back to networking now, the question always was, how do you connect these hundreds of thousands of servers in this, these gigantic cloud service data centers in a way that the cloud applications can scale easily. Now, the ideal cloud network uh, would be one that is truly transparent, that you don't see. Basically, predictable bandwidth from every server to any other server, you know, 10 gigabit bandwidth, microseconds of latency, that would be ideal because that avoids the need for data placement, which means that the applications would have to know where they're running and where the data resides. And uh, that, that actually was the case 10 years ago when people first started to build cloud data centers. They had these uh, pods or clusters, which were like you know, 64 racks that were tightly connected, another group of 64 racks. But it was becoming very, very quickly clear that that was just not practical. So the way all of these uh, cloud data centers are being built today is with a leaf spine architecture where every uh, where you have consistent bandwidth from any server to any other server and there's many many paths uh, across this cloud so this picture shows a two-tier architecture which scales to maybe ten thousands of servers obviously that's not big enough for the large cloud here's a picture of the uh, facebook multi-level uh, fabric which uh, has at least three if not four tiers and it's uh, uh, this was originally introduced in 2014 i believe 10 gigabit at the edge, 40 gigabit between the leaf and the spine switches. And it uses all layer 3 ECMP load balancing, so there's an incredible number of paths between each top of rack switch and any other switch, uh, using flow-based hashing to, to distribute the load. And, and the great thing with this fabric is uh, that has been upgraded to, to 100 gigabit uh, in the leaf and spine connection, and eventually will go to 400 gigabit, so it will actually have a tenfold speed up uh, from 40 gigabit to 400 gigabit in a period of about five years. And this is just in time for this increase in traffic. Uh, again, this is a picture from uh, Facebook talking about the uh, amount of traffic growth uh, in their internal network. You can see the, the error kind of accelerates up to the right. Uh, and uh, the little green bar on the bottom, that's the traffic that goes outside of the network back to the consumer. So the vast amount of network traffic is between the servers to, you know, to figure out what your friends are doing and so on. Uh, the same kind of picture from, uh, from Google. Uh, this is a, a slide from that Urs Hersley showed last year uh, that talked about that their internal measurement indicated that their inter intra data center bandwidth is growing a factor of two every year. And this is driven by all the applications they're doing, including uh, AI and machine learning. So how do we uh, keep up with all this growth in, in traffic? Uh, needless to say, the easiest way to go faster is to go faster, and in particular, to take advantage of the Ethernet speed transitions that are uh, coming our way to scale the throughput. Now, here's a marketing chart that talks about the number of ports uh, shipped in the Ethernet market um, uh, up through last year, the majority of the high-speed ports uh, was actually 40 gigabit. 40 gigabit is known as steep decline. 100 gigabit is on a steep increase. 
to put some numbers on this chart, uh, the industry in 2016 shipped a little less than a million ports. Last year, it was a little less than 5 million. This year, the number is expected to, uh, to pass 10 million. And by 2020, it's projected to be 20 million. So it's an incredible increase in the number of high bandwidth 100 gigabit ports. Now, 400 gigabit, uh, there's a whole bunch of announcements, uh, including at this event here. But in reality, shipments will start next calendar year, and they will grow slowly at first um, and uh, b you know, pick up some speed in 2020 and then grow significantly into 21, 22. Keep in mind that each 400 gig port is four times the speed of a 100 gig port. So they will actually pass in bandwidth the 100 gig uh, network by the end perhaps of 21, or certainly by 22. Now, what's the timeline on 400 gig? There's first switch silicon in the lab and first 400 gig optics on the lab. It typically takes us a year to get from first silicon to a shipping product. This allows for one silicon spin on both of the switch chip and the optics. And the key here is that you can only deploy 400 gig in any volume if there's volume optics, and uh, nobody wants a replay of the 100 gig c 4 experience. For those of you who are not involved in this, there was a shortage of these optics for the last two years. In fact, they're still a little hard to find. But we need volume availability of 400 gig optics, and that's not going to happen until probably the second half of 2019. And by volume, I mean that people can buy hundreds of thousands of these optics uh, at a time. The entire 400 gig port forecast uh, from the lower market research is for this next calendar year, 500,000 ports. For the 2020 year, 3 million, and for 21, 5 million. So there's a nice growth here, but again, the majority of growth, 2020 and 21. Now, looking at the places where 400 gig would be deployed in the network, it's across the whole stack. This is a picture from uh, Microsoft that was presented at a IEEE meeting a couple of years ago, actually. And it shows that at the bottom, you have a copper cable connecting the servers in the rack to the top of rack switch. So that's not going to change. That's the cheapest way to connect the server. Then uh, typically AOC cables, uh, they connect the tour switch to the leaf switch. This is like 20 or 30 meter reach. Then uh, either uh, parallel optics, which is called DR4, or, or duplex optics, FO4, to connect those leaves to the swine switch. And then uh, LR4 uh, or uh, other technologies that can go 10 kilometers to the next building, or 400 gig CR, which can go 100 kilometers to a data center um, down uh, the, the street in the metro area. So the, the use cases for 400 gig include everything from copper cable on one side to this metro reach 100 kilometer or more connection. The point here is that no single technology addresses all the needs, even in the uh, hyperscale uh, data cloud data center. And again, we're going from copper cables to SR8, AOC cables, DR4, FR4 for the leaf spine, LR8, c 8 for campus reach, and 400 gig ZR for the longer metro reach. So now let me switch topics a little bit and talk about merchant silicon, uh, because the role of merchant silicon is perhaps somewhat underappreciated in, in the evolution of uh, data center networking. Uh, Ten years ago, there was a single chip that was useful for uh, uh, data center networking, which was a very small 24 by 10 gig chip. Uh, and uh, we used it successfully on, on Wall Street for ultra low latency trading. But it was actually way too small for the cloud. Uh, back in 2012 was the first uh, spine switch that allowed us to build larger modular chassis kind of configurations. And that became the basis of a lot of the early uh, cloud networking deployments. As of 2016, there's merchant silicon solutions for the entire networking stack, from the, the optical transport um, uh, to the core routing, edge routing, and leaf and spine, of course. Uh, there's still some proprietary chips out there. Uh, they're not growing, as far as we can tell. Uh, in particular, in the cloud, it's basically all merchant silicon. Now, the reason for that is obvious, which is merchant silicon has led the way in, in performance improvements uh, year after year. There was a new industry first in, in capacity and buffer capacity and routing capability and table sizes. And this is continuing uh, this year with the announcement of the first 32 port 400 gig switch chips. And, and we expect, if every reason to expect, this will continue in the future. Uh, this is a little chart uh, of how greatly this performance improves. It was basically doubling the throughput per chip every other year. 
And uh, again, the, the 30 foot 400 gig chip is the one that will ship next calendar year in volume. Now, underlying that, uh, there was an important technology transition, which is the speed of the I.O. lanes. Until uh, about 2016, all the I.O. lanes were 10 gigabit in size. So a single port was 10 gig, four lanes was a 40 gig port. With the introduction of 25 gig service, a single port became 25 gig, four lanes 100 gig, which is the standard that's being used today. The next generation of switch chips coming out again in volume next year will have 50 gig lanes. So with uh, two lanes, you can do 100 gig. With four lanes, you can do 200 gig. With eight lanes, you can do 400 gig. And then maybe in 21, we'll see switch chips that have 100 gig lanes. So the 400 gig is just four lines. Now, why is that so important? Because these service transitions are not only the easiest way to scale the chip performance, the switch chip, but they also drive all the optic standards and the optics ecosystem because they have to adopt to these faster speeds. And the point of this is this tr these transitions are happening fairly quickly. If you look at this waterfall, we're in the, the green part of the waterfall, which is the 25G uh, generation, which is still growing in volume, by the way. So it's, you know, it's very great volume there. But that will be followed starting in 19 with the 50 gig generation, uh, which eventually will have more volume than the current 25 gig, and then uh, that will be followed by the 100 gig generation. It's really hard to go faster than 100 gig on a PC board with electrical traces, so the 100 gig will be around uh, for a long time. But what this means for the optics is we need different optics that perfectly match these speeds over time. So today, the highest volume is 100 gig CWM4, which is four lanes of 25 gig. With 50 gig, that would have been 200 gig sealer VM4. There's some people that will deploy this, but most people look forward to the four lane by 100, which is the 400 gig f 4 which is sort of the next step. And the same on the parallel sync mode fiber. Today, the most common standard is called 100 gig PSM4 for four lanes of 25 gig, and that will become 100 gig uh, typo here, DO4. So it is this relentless match of silicon, merchant silicon, and service upgrades that drive the optics transitions. And this gets me to the key point of this talk, which is what are the three most important optics for 400 gig? Number one, uh, 400 gig DR4. So this is 400 gig over parallel single mode fiber using eight fibers. It has about a 500 meter reach, uh, MTP connectors, estimated power eight watts in 2020. The great thing about this optics is it works over the same fiber plant as the 100 gig PSM4 today, it uses the same number of fibers. And you can split those 400 gig DR4 ports into four high density 100 gig DR1 ports. The second one, which may be higher volume, is 400 gig over duplex fiber. So that's called 400 gig F04. Two kilometer reach. Uh, there's an effort to extend this all the way to 10 kilometer with LR4. Standard LC connector. Again, roughly 8 watts power in 2020. And again, this works on the same fiber plant as the 100 gig CWM4 today. And the final one, uh, which is uh, for, the, for the long reach, is called Fornagig ZR. So this is actually a, a DC or a digital coherent optics that uses high order at, uh, modulation called 16 QAM to modulate in a Fornagig with fancy modulation over single coherent wavelength of light. You can put 50 or 60 of those across one dark fiber, getting you over 20 terabits of bandwidth. This. This is truly a marvel in engineering. Uh, a module like this today is like three by five inch size and takes six to seven watts. The next generation, they've crammed this down into a microscopic form factor that fits inside these industry standard form factor pluggables at 15 watts. So the, this can be plugged into any standard switch router port at the same density as, as the data center reach optics. So with these three optics, there's a very smooth transition in terms of being able to use the same fiber infrastructure that's being used today in the 100 gig world. So again, the parallel single mode will go to 400 DR4, the duplex fiber goes to 400 gig F04, and the 100 kilometer reach goes to 400 gig ZR. And all of these are forwards compatible with 100 gig switch lanes and are believed to be the highest volume optics in their respective uh, use cases and thus drive the best uh, economics. So that's the story on pluggable optics. Now, there's a whole separate idea, which is what else can we do to really improve things? And this is now a little more in the future. It will take a couple of years to get there. But the point is, today, almost all optics plug into the front of the, the switch. Uh, and 
what would happen if you could put these optics right on the board or preferably on the switch chip itself. So there is in fact an effort uh, called uh, COBO, called Consortium for Onboard Optics, that defined a standard for moving optics on the board. And um, this is interesting because it does uh, improve sort of the um, deployment use case. You can basically s install a fully assembled switch and optics right into the install base. So it has operational benefits. But from a, from a power perspective, it uses the same uh, I.O. power and the same optics as the plug case. It's really the same power and the same density. Now, if the optics were moved directly on that module, it could save up to 30% of the total system power because it eliminates the power for the high-speed I.O. That, that drives the signal from the switch chip to the optics. So it's hard to believe, but 30% of the whole power in the switch is spent just sending the signals back and forth to these traces. Now, what would something like that look like? This is a, a packaging study, not, not a product. Okay, this is a concept of a, a 51.2 terabit one U switch that has 128 400 gig ports. You can see this mega switch chip in the middle here, surrounded by four optical tiles. Each tile has 128 lanes at 100 gigabit speed. There's behind it, there's four laser sources that drive the uh, optical wavelength into these modulators that are co-packaged. And this system is projected to take about a kilowatt power, um, and so it fits in the one U form factor, and it would be eight watts per 400 gig port, which is about one third of the power of a 400 gig switch that's going to be uh, shipping next calendar year. So this obviously has some real benefits on density and power. And um, besides the, the lower power and the density, there's also some cost advantages, which is, it turns out, the, the kind of optics that are useful for co-packaging scale sublinear with the number of channels. So the, the more channels you add to the chip, the cheaper it gets per channel. And, and that has its attractions. And finally, it actually has the promise of greater reliability, because if you separate out the laser source, you have just a couple of lasers that pump in the light for all the optics, and that's much more reliable than having a laser on each optics. So the advantages are obvious. The, the challenges are uh, primarily technical, which is, you know, what's the best uh, low power interface between the switch chip and the optics? This clearly needs some kind of multi-vendor standardization. We need the optics vendors, the chip vendors, and the packaging vendors to, to work together here. But maybe the most befuzzling challenge is the supply chain, which is you know, who buys which part, who puts it together, who is responsible for the yield, and so on at each stage of manufacturing. So to solve these problems, um, we came up with a fairly simple proposal, which is an electrical connector known as an interposer connector that decouples the optics engines from the BGA uh, module where the switch chip resides. These interposer connectors, uh, you're probably not familiar with them, they're tiny, they're like a quarter of a millimeter thick, but they solve the practical problem that you can take a fully tested switch chip and fully tested optics and put them together at the manufacturing site without needing a cle clean room or advanced process equipment. So th the whole point of this is we've got to make this manufacturable so it can be done by standard contract manufacturers at, at low cost. And it also enables Repairability, if an optics were to fail, you can actually remove it and replace it, uh, perhaps even the field. And finally, it allows uh, configurability, meaning you can support different kind of optics like 400 gig DR4 and FR4 or LR4 on the same uh, uh, module. So in summary, uh, cool packaged optics have a significant promise of, of power reduction and cost reduction. What's absolutely key is to do this in a standardized fashion. Uh, most likely around a standardized electrical connector that defines the electrical interface as well as the physical form factor. Uh, this is clearly a multi-year project, so don't expect this uh, next year or anytime soon. But let's get started now. Which brings me to my last topic, which is uh, optics and standards. Now, we, we all know the importance of standards because standards drive volume, and without volumes, the economics don't work, right? And both silicon development and optics development takes a long time, two, three years, from start of product development. But you can't really get started until you have a standard, because otherwise you don't know what you're going to build, right? 
So standards fundamentally drive the speed of progress because we need a standard to get going on the components. And the standards group for Ethernet networking is the IEEE 802.3 LAN standards group, which over the years, this group started in 1992, in 1982, sorry, has written, I think, 50 or 60 standards for Ethernet, starting with the original 10 megabit and the 100 megabit and the gigabit and the 10 gigabit and the 40 gigabit and so on. An incredible amount of work was done by a lot of people and this, they deserve full credit for this, this important contribution to the industry advancing the speed of Ethernet over the years. But there is one problem, which is it takes roughly three years to create one of these standards. The Fornegeek Ethernet standard work uh, started in earnest in September 2015. There was actually about a year of work before it got to the so-called project authorization request, and it was just finished last December. In fact, all uh, traditional Ethernet standards work took about three years. It doesn't matter if it was the gigabit or the 10 gigabit. The problem now is that the optics can't wait three years to have a standard and take another three years for development. So the problem here is, uh, on the 100 gig standard specifically, when it was completed in 2010, remember, Ethernet 100 gig only took off in 2015, so the standard was written years before deployment. The original optics in the standards were called Hanagig LR4, which is a 10-kilometer reach, you know, dense modulated kind of optics, and Hanagig SR10, 10 by 10. Neither one of these optics addressed the large cloud market today. There was actually a, a separate IEEE for it in between called IEEE 802.3BM to define lower cost optics, in particular the Hanagig CWM4 and the PSM4, which are the high volume today. The problem was this group met for two years and neither proposal ever made it to a vote because under IEEE voting rules, you need 75% majority to pass it as a standard and because there was two proposals, no group ever got to 75%. Now, after that, the industry jumped in and created MSA definitions for these optics and that was fine, but we essentially lost two years getting going on these optics, which resulted in the shortage of the CLM4, which we've seen for the last two years. And unfortunately, we have a replay of this now with Fauna Geek. So the Fauna Geek optics in the IEEE standard are SR16, 16 lanes of 25 gig, which nobody will ever use. FR8 and LR8, which, which do work, but they're kind of expensive. And then DR4, which is the only one standard on this list that's actually going to be high volume. The IEEE didn't have either time or the, the, the process to standardize the Fauna Geek FR4 and LR4, which are likely the highest volume. Luckily, there's a new uh, MSA known as the 100 gig Lambda Multisource Agreement, and that MSA started last September. It was announced. It finished the standard by January, so it took them a little more, not even four months of time, you know, to write out the specs for the optics that were missing, in particular, for the gig uh, FR4, which is the, the duplex standard. Um, now, how do these MSA groups work? Well, the first comment is that you can predict the outcome of any of these standards effort in the world actually by the, the constituency of the group and the voting rules, right? So with an MSA, what happens is you, you have people coming together that actually want to write the spec as quickly as possible. They have typically weekly meetings, you know, phone, uh, whatever, very active participation. And as a result, the timelines really get compressed. And, and typical efforts last, you know, months, not, not years. So basically, these MSCs are driven by, by members that have a shared goal, and there's no sort of dissenting parties blocking progress. And as a result, we now have a plethora of MSAs, both for the 400 gig optics, for the new versions of 100 gig optics, like the 100 gig Lambda, and uh, also for the new form factors coming out. But the bottom line is this. We do need standards for everything that's not included in the IEEE specs, because you cannot build a product without a standard. And to sum this up here, you know, we, we desperately need these 400 gig optic standards now because these products have to ship, you know, in volume next year. And it, it, I would commend the activities of all these, these MSA groups to advance these standards quickly. And this has been working well. Uh, a very useful role that OCP can play here is to promote and advocate the, the most important optic standards that are good for cloud networks going forward because that, of course, drives the, the vendors and, and the industry uh, to do that. And with this, I thank you for your attention, and um, I'll be around later if you want to talk about this more. But thank you very much.